Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start because I know they're running behind time. And, um, I'll cut it short if need be. Um, today I want to talk about, um, I'm a translator and historian of manga, as you might know. Um, today I want to talk about a book that was supposed to be out for SPX, but thanks mainly to the fact that I did too much research for the essay, which oftentimes happens, that it's been postponed. Uh, hopefully it'll be out sometime this winter, uh, but no promises there. And this is a sequel to a book. Uh, the book will be published um, by Bubbles um, out of Richmond. It will be their second manga publication. Uh, it will be called uh, Iga Gurikun, uh, Young Judo Master. It's a manga from the 1950s, and that's the, the core of what I'm talking about today. It's a sequel, as I'll explain in a second, to um, the book that I did with uh, Bubbles this past year, which was Inoue Kazuo's uh, Bat Kid, which is not the first baseball manga, um, but the first um, extended baseball serial and kind of seen as the beginnings of baseball manga as a major category um, in Japanese comics. So what I want to talk about today is the gigantic impact that um, this title had, Igagurikun. Um, it was serialized in a magazine called Boken O, Adventure King, um, in the, uh, from 1952 to 1954. Uh, it was authored by someone named Afukui Eichi. Afukui Eichi is well known in the history of manga, for those people who know some of the older history of manga. However, his career as a cartoonist was quite short, uh, from 1949 to 1954. What you're seeing on the right is the, extend, is the book edition of Igaguri um, from the 1950s. Uh, in extent, the first three volumes are by, by Fukui, and the rest are by... Uh, different authors. What we're publishing from Bubbles is basically the first two books, two and a half books is one, uh, roughly about this, about 300 pages of manga. Basically, Fukui's tenure on the title. Now, Fukui is um, interesting because uh, he started off, uh, he submitted cartoons back in the 1930s to Shonen Club, which was what a lot of aspiring cartoonists did if you were young, back before World War II. Shonen Club is the magazine that carried Norakuro, the big war manga, uh, inspired by uh, American comics and uh, other things. Um, so it was the main venue um, for uh, manga, and is also the magazine uh, published by Kodansha, who's still around today, obviously, uh, that established manga as big kids' entertainment in the 1930s. Uh, Fukui's first uh, publications as cartoons were for Shonen Club in the 1930s. Uh, they had an amateur corner. Um, that a number of cartoonists uh, published um, in. Uh, I have not seen his uh, comics from that period, but soon after that, um, he instead turned towards animation. And he animated, he drew animation, um, different sorts, for different types of companies uh, from the late 30s and the early 40s during the war, uh, originally for newsreel companies, uh, basically companies that were showing newsreels of current events prior to feature films. Um, and he was also doing animation work for them, which really took off during the war. And the kind of animation he was doing was animated maps showing the expansion of the Japanese Empire, uh, maps showing uh, bomb airstrikes and other types of combat operations on the continent by the Japanese Empire. So he was doing that kind of supplementary animation. Um, 1945, propaganda departments uh, obviously shut down. You know, many of these uh, production teams were obliterated by the bombings of Japan. But very soon after the war, uh, the old uh, crews that were working on animation, they created their own new um, animation companies. Uh, Fukui Eichi, having a number of years uh, under his belt, uh, joined one of these and was an animator through much of the American occupation through the late 1940s. As that industry also started shifting, um, smaller units uh, closing and bigger ones being absorbed, uh, ones being absorbed by bigger publishing uh, 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 production, uh, uh, film companies. Uh, a number of the older animators uh, defected to other industries. And one place they defected was to manga, because manga in the late 1940s was growing. This is the era when Tezuka Osamu starts really becoming famous. Um, so Fukui Eichi, he has old contacts. He has relationships with Kodansha. He knows some of the older Kodansha artists, even though he himself was not a professional cartoonist. And they help him get work in the new industry, the new booming industry of, of manga. Um, the main magazine he works for 
is uh, initially is um, a magazine called Manga Shonen. And Manga Shonen was founded in late 1947 by the former editor of Shonen Club prior to the war, named Kato Kenichi. Um, Manga Shonen is known for a lot of things. It was where the first chapters of, it was where uh, Tezuka's Jungle Emperor was serialized in the early 50s. It was where the first version chapters of uh, Tezuka's Phoenix were serialized, um, not the ones that have been translated into English. Um, various other things. It's where also there a number of cartoonists that became, became big in the 50s and 60s published their first cartoons in the, in the reader's pages. Uh, Tatsumi Yoshihiro, um, who else? Even graphic designers like Tanami Keiichi, Yoko Tadanori. So it became a hothouse uh, for aspiring cartoonists. And Tatsumi talks about it a lot in Drifting Life. Um, but I'm interesting here because it was also the home for Bat Kid. And Bat Kid uh, carried manga shonen for the first couple of years until Tezuka came along and popularity of his manga started after that carrying that, which is after Inoue Kazuo dies um, from a kind of pneumonia in 1940, uh, 1949. Now, Bat Kid was very popular. And this is what the book form, the one that we translated, looks like. It was very popular. Baseball was humongously popular. Baseball had been hugely popular in Japan going back to the late 19th century. Uh, was huge entertainment from the 1920s and 30s, also amongst kids. Uh, manga Shonen and Bat Kid was designed to capitalize on that popularity of baseball. But so when Inoue Kazuo, uh, Kazuo suddenly died, uh, Manga Shonen was in trouble because their top selling uh, manga, the most popular manga, didn't have an artist anymore. So what they did was they hired, they put out a call to all their fans and said, uh, propose your own Bat Kid stories. So they started doing that and they submitted them, but oftentimes what they accepted, what came in, was not polished in terms of the artwork. So they hired someone who did not have a lot of practice in manga per se, but had a lot of practice drawing through the animation industry to clean up the artwork, and sometimes, not in this case, to apply a color if they were doing it duotone. That person was Fukui Eichi. His, main, his first um, <clears throat> uh, cartooning job was basically redrawing submissions of Bat Kid to Manga Shonen. Um, and for those of you, how many of you read Bat Kid? Yeah. A few of you? Uh, we're down to our like, last maybe 50 copies, so you might want to, if you're interested, we should buy a copy at Bubbles Table um, today. But um, so he redrew it. The, the drawing is more dynamic, a little bit smoother than what Inoue Kazuo did. Kazuo did, for those of you who have kind of looked at some of uh, Bat Kid stuff, you, you might be able to perceive it. I know the, the panels here are, are minuscule. Um, but you know, he added his own flavor to it, even though it was very much uh, modeled on Inoue's work. Um, Fukui also started drawing single panel uh, humorous cartoons uh, for manga shonen, some of which feature uh, baseball. Uh, the one at the top right, it's a joke about kids are watching this uh, film at school. Uh, the base runners are running the wrong way up the third baseline, and they realize, the teacher realized that he has a film flipped. And then on the top left, is a player on the way to the game, and he asks, he asks a palm reader, um, what is going to be my future in the game? And he shows him his glove instead. So these are the kind of things that Fukui was originally drawing. He also started in 1951 his uh, own baseball manga. And this is not like baseball manga that we come to know later on in the late 50s and 1960s. You know, beginning in the 1960s and 1970s, Baseball manga are basically battle manga. They're kind of blood sport manga with a lot of effects uh, influenced by, I'll talk about it a little bit later, martial arts, ninja comics, superhero type comics. Back in this day, um, they're more about good kids who play baseball. And there's as much action off the field as there is on, helping parents, helping dad run his business, helping dad uh, run the family because you know mothers were killed during the war, et cetera, et cetera. So they're about good kids who also happen to uh, play baseball. So that's what uh, Iga Fukui's um, first manga, serialized manga was, uh, Don Mai Kun, the Don't Sweat It Kid. <clears throat> Here's another page, another group of pages. So just as, so Don Mai Kun ends in uh, December 1951, and the very next month, um, Igaguri uh, begins. Um, I wrote an article a number of years ago on TCJ called uh, Fukui Eichi 
and man, I can't even remember what it's called. The proto, the, be, the proto Gekiga something or other. I don't know. It's about Tez It's basically about this manga and Tezuka's poor reaction to it. Uh, Tezuka Osamu was king of manga at the time, um, and he never wanted to leave office. Right. So he was. Um, upset at any time, any kind of upstart challenged him whatsoever, you know. So the first person that he was angry at and started taking pot shots in public, in publication, was a Fukui Eiji. There's a whole story, I'm not going to go into it today, about how he, uh, in Tezuka's, one of his many how to draw manga uh, serials that he did in the early 50s, he points at the kind of things that Fukui developed in his manga and is saying, this is bad, lazy cartooning, right, without naming him. So Fukui actually went to Tezuka's house, drunk, and shook him down. And then Tezuka offers another apology kind of in another manga. I've written about this uh, online, and it'll end up in the essay for, for Bat Kid as well. So Igaguri starts off. Um, it's about this kid, Igaguri, which means Igaguri is a chestnut that's on the burr on the outside of the chestnut, right? This, the pointy burr. Um, and it's referring mainly to his shaved head, right? So it's like spiky like a, a, a chestnut, right? So he's a transfer student who comes in, and it's about his life as a practitioner of judo. Now, judo in Japan, there's a lot of martial arts in Japan, obviously. Some of them are more or less fantastic, like ninjutsu. Judo, in terms of martial arts that are actually practiced in Japan, judo in the modern period is the most important in terms of it was practiced by the largest number of people and had the most impact ideologically on both Japanese society, Japanese institution, education, and also on Japanese culture, including manga. Going back to someone named Kano Jigoro, who was uh, <coughs> um, active in the Meiji period, the late 19th and the early 20th century, he saw that the martial arts, different things that are called jujutsu, were sloppy, um, that the dojos were corrupt, and he wanted to unify practices of jujutsu into something more rational uh, and something that was more moral. Okay? So he, form, he formed the way of ju, a way of softness, of you know, a type of martial art that's not about attacks, but about receiving and flipping and tossing that way, using people's strength against them. So he found the way of judo that way. By the early 20th century, uh, judo, on, based on Kano's uh, influence, is, becomes compulsory in Japanese schools. So every kid prior to the 19, 1945 practiced judo while they're in school. Uh, in, an, in addition, it was adopted by the Japanese police, by the Japanese military. So Kano's principles and his practice of judo, judo both as a martial art and as a life philosophy, had a massive impact on pre uh, pre, uh, early 20th century Japan. In popular culture, the biggest expression was this book, Sugata Sanshiro. It was a, a fictionalized account, semi, very vaguely fic fictionalized account of one of Kano Jigoro's students. Okay? It became big because, not just because the novel was huge in 19, when it was released in 1942, but it was quickly adapted by Kurosawa Akira as his first movie, and he also did a sequel. So Kurosawa, you know, so Kurosawa Akira, he was active doing various things, script writing and different types of arts prior to this, but his breakout was doing this, which was a movie, a set of movies that was also, because of the status of judo in Japanese society, uh, acceptable to militarists uh, in Japan during the 1940s. It's a semi-propaganda film, without being overtly so, all the way through. This also had a huge impact subsequently on manga because judo was banned, like all martial arts, was banned for a while in, in Japan during the American occupation. But judo, based, judo <clears throat> was uh, reinstituted quite quickly because judo's global spread uh, in the early 20th century meant it had many practitioners amongst Americans and American soldiers as well. So these movies were re-released after the occupation had a huge hit. Right? Now, one of, the, one of the results is that you start seeing a lot of judo manga in the 1950s, almost immediately after the American occupation ends. Uh, the first big one, and the one that really initiates and sparks a boom um, in manga, is Fukui Eiichi's uh, work. Now, I'm racing along, but two, two features that about Fukui Eiichi that are important. One is the moral side, that Igaguri, this judo boy, young judo master, one thing is that he's a good kid. Um, 
It's hard, maybe hard to read here, but you know, he refuses to fight. He will only fight if he has to. Um, and he even uses fighting as a way to not fight. So here on the bottom left, you see that he uses his flipping techniques in order to uh, dispatch his uh, foe so he doesn't have to fight by throwing in the back of a moving truck. Right? So there's this whole thing about judo not only makes you um, a badass in terms of how you can use your body and your fists, but it also um, gives you the uh, self-composure and the ability to not get in trouble and to leave a moral and whole and responsible life. So it's a very didactic manga, is uh, one aspect of it. And that's one of the big impacts that Igaguri had on uh, manga in subsequent years and decades. The other thing is its, intense, its intensive use of cinematic techniques and special effects. These are things, of course, you see in manga going back to the 1920s and 1930s. There are things that are used uh, quite extensively uh, by Tezuka Osamu by the late 1940s and early 1950s. However, Fukui, what Fukui does, and this is also uh, kind of related to his experiences as an animator who has a lot of um, practice making storyboards and working with different types of cinematic techniques, and also as someone who was doing um, animation of just uh, effects that were overlaid on newsreels, et cetera. So he had this back uh, ground and this kind of like catalog of techniques about how to use animation techniques and cinematic techniques, uh, and he applied those to manga. So you get it, especially the later chapters of Fukui, of, of Igaguri, you get a much more intensely uh, cinematic um, manga with a lot more uh, effects, right? And this is the kind of thing that Tezuka derides in some of his uh, how-to manuals in the early 50s saying that this is lazy cartooning, that it's easy to fill a panel with just clouds, it's easy to fill a panel with just a hurricane and an explosion or just an eyeball, right? So Tezuka had done this kind of thing, but he did it on one or two pages, and then the rest is a mix of different types of cartooning, kind of zany action, um, dialogue, um, a lot of slapstick, right? There's, there's a lot less slapstick also in Fukui. So he does this, right? <coughs> There's some other pages, some action pages. Another thing you see in judo manga uh, is that what is, what is the evil martial art that oftentimes the judo person has to combat against? It's karate. Uh, karate becomes established as the uh, powerful and dangerous, deadly uh, martial art uh, uh, practiced by um, ruffians and drunks and evil men, right? Um, it is that schematic oftentimes in manga, at least up to the 70s. You can, might be able to come up with examples in, in recent manga. But that's established also in Igaguri, right? The art of not fighting judo against the art of killing um, karate. Right? And so things like this. <clears throat> As you can see, the manga has been fully translated. It's just waiting on me to finish the essay. Now... <clears throat> The other thing that these techniques enable is for Fukui to draw quickly. Right? It's, uh, <clears throat> you can spread out the story more. Uh, each unit is simpler to draw. Um, and this is, kind of becomes a necessary uh, feature of cartooning for the Japanese manga industry by the 1950s. One of the reasons is that there are more and more <laughs> Where is it? Can you see it? <laughs> All right. Um, so manga, more and more manga magazines. In boys' magazines, there are the quotient of manga versus prose and mixed prose and image com uh, content is increasing. So there's more manga to be drawn. Right? In addition, manga magazines to compete at each other in the 1950s. Uh, they revive something known as furoku, which are these bonus inserts. So there are comics usually. Sometimes there are little uh, paper models and other types of things. But there's furoku, these bonus er insert comic books. And they can be anywhere from 30 pages to 120 pages. So in addition to their, at this point, manga magazines are monthly. In addition to the 8 to 12 to 20 pages that you have to draw a month, the uh, publisher is more or less demanded that you also add in another 30 to 120 pages of standalone manga. So artists need ways to produce faster, but still make things that are impressive, or at least exciting to children. So these cinematic techniques come along at a very uh, appropriate or a convenient time for artists, right? 
Fukui <coughs> um, apparently worked too hard. Uh, he drunk, drank a lot. Uh, well, he apparently got no exercise and ate poorly. Um, he was on the heavy side by Japanese uh, standards. Um, and in 1954, um, at the age of what? At the age of 33, 34, he died from overwork. Um, his death uh, got made a lot, number of cartoonists, including Tezuka, to get together and to pressure Japanese uh, youth magazine publishers to pay better and to kind of take the pressure off uh, in terms of deadlines, which doesn't really happen, but they at least increase pay rates, okay? So Fukui Eiichi kind of marked a moment, not only were these techniques enabled kind of faster production, but he was also kind of, you know, the sacrificial victim for making that system at least relatively more, um, uh, <clears throat> what's the right word? Um, doable, that's not a good word, but for the art cartoonist doing it, more more money, a little bit less pressure, a lot more kind of teamwork involved. When he dies, there's a out large outpouring. Tezuka also writes some stuff about him. Tezuka includes a dead Fukui in one of his manga. Uh, manga Shonen runs a special issue. Um, that's Fukui dead uh, r dancing with animals on the right. That's him practicing judo because Igaguri by that point had become uh, arguably the most popular manga, which really drove Tezuka nuts. Um, so he mem memorialized um, in manga shonen and other venues. Igaguri is uh, continued in, by um, its magazine, Boken O, by another artist, and it continues until the late 1950s. It goes on for a very long time. In the 1950s, due to Igaguri's um, success, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, judo manga. And pretty much any artist in the who broke in the 1950s had to, or did at some point, drew a judo manga. So <clears throat> what that means is not only that they had practiced drawing judo, these kind of good judo boys, right? But they also had practiced um, drawing judo techniques in the type of cinematic paddling that went along with it. And this ultimately becomes the uh, groundwork for the development of Gekiga, circa 1955-1956. So when people usually talk about Gekiga, they usually understand it as a kind of post-Tezuka um, type of cartooning that is designed for mainly the mystery genre, so that you use more visual techniques and pacing to create a sense of suspense and shock in, in your readers. And that is indeed how it spread in 1956 and afterwards, and subsequently through gang land, gang land action and, and other genres. But prior to that, the artists who went to create the new uh, genre of Gekiga, the new style of Gekiga, all did judo manga. And if they didn't do judo manga, they did uh, karate manga, or they did uh, kendo manga, things that were kind of spun out from uh, Igaguri's success. One of them was Matsumoto Masahiko, who is the main person that Tatsumi saw as what he wanted to do. So Matsumoto Masahiko, his first hit was a judo manga. Um, and this was published with uh, Hinomaru Bunko, which is the rent Kashihon publisher, the rental manga publisher, that subsequently published um, Tatsumi's Black Blizzard. It became the publisher that really got the Gekiga movement going. So his first manga was this. And you can see at top it says judo manga in English, or freshly coming out of the occupation. Um, and it says uh, Bochan uh, Sanshiro. So it's referring to um, Sugata Sanshiro, the novel that Kurosawa um, adapted. And all these artists, in addition to looking at Igaguri, they were also, they, they knew Kurosawa's films very well. And there's a number of scenes that were clearly modeled on Kurosawa's movies. You know, in books like Drifting Life and other texts, they talk about the impact of Kurosawa on cartooning, and oftentimes things like Seven Samurai come up, but it's probably Sugata Sanshiro, the judo movie, that, the judo pair of movies that had a larger impact on uh, these Gekiga artists, these artists in the 1950s in terms of cartooning. And it's not just about action, it's also about scenography, about like moonlit nights in which fights happen, um, you know, like see of like, whatever, crickets chirping at the moment of battle, those kind of things. It's like a lot of that comes out of those kind of martial arts movies. So this is Matsumoto's first hit um, for Hinomaru Bunko, and it really established the publisher as a viable um, a, a venture. Venture, 
uh, enterprise. And here you can always see things that Matsumoto became famous for, um, uh, kind of low uh, angle shots, right, looking up. Uh, <clears throat> also a number of, you see, how, see how crude the drawing was also in these early days. But, and then also something you see a lot with judo manga is that the necessity of having kind of low angles um, in order to depict certain types of action. Uh, bodies being thrown, body being thrown in the air, and then bodies falling. And oftentimes in these scenes, bodies fall uh, below ground level into ditches and into rivers, um, et cetera. So this kind of low action uh, image that you oftentimes see uh, enables artists to kind of expand, expand the panel without expanding the frame, right? It creates space inside the panel. So you kind of have these like rotational movements happening, right? It's no longer sword fighting going back and forth like this, right? You have to have movement back and forth in space. So kind of judo, these, these were kind of already in manga, but the way that judo, the flipping and stuff uh, happens, it kind of necessitated a different type of sp spatial sense inside the panel frame for manga, right? So you see a lot of images like this. The books are in all color. I just happen to have the, the color pages here. Now Matsumoto, uh, continue, he, he draws about six maybe judo manga. Um, the big one is this one called uh, Kaidanji, A Man Amongst Boys. It is very clearly uh, inspired by the Tomita Tsunio uh, book, the Tsugata Sanshiro book. It's set in the Meiji period in the late 19th century. Um, it starts off with a group of jujutsu ruffians, and they have to go against this character who's modeled on Tsugata Sanshiro, who's uh, learning the art of, the better art of judo, right? Now this manga is uh, famous in manga history and appears in Drifting Life because it's bigger format. Um, manga, the Kashi Hon, the, other, the one I showed before this, Cactus Kid, is um, B6 in, in paper size, so it's, it's about what? Five by six or so. And then this one is, what is it, A5, I guess? So it's a bigger format, and I guess it would be about six by eight, okay? Tatsumi was already drawing for Hinomaru Bunko by this point. He saw this and said, I want to draw like that too. I want to use bigger page space in order to create these more dan dynamic pages. But he wasn't allowed to. He had to draw other manga for a while. But Matsumoto was the best-selling artist at Hinomaru Bunko before Tatsumi got big, and he was drawing manga like this, using the bigger formats. So this bigger format page and the type of cartooning it enabled was also structured around judo manga in these early days. And who else does judo manga? Well, everybody, but so does Tatsumi. Um, now, Tatsumi, prior to this, had drawn a number of adventure manga. He had drawn a number of mystery manga, but they're not very mysterious. They're, they have detectives and villains and capes and deaths and secrets, uh, but they don't use that Gekiga style of you know, uh, suspenseful uh, paneling. Right? One of the first works in which he does use that kind of paneling is instead a judo manga. And this one called uh, Kaika no Oni. Uh, Kaika refers to the era of opening a civilization in the late 19th century to Western uh, knowledge and technology, right? So the demon of civilization refers to yet another character who is modeled on Sugata Sanshiro, right? There are hundreds of characters like this in manga from the 1950s. So you got pages like this. Lots of something else that becomes typical of manga later. What? Lots of ellipses. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so you also see like in addition to these, you know, these spaces that project backwards or angles that look upward to create space, you also get a lot of up, upside, it's kind of weird upside down images you see a lot in, in judo because of bodies being flipped over. And these bodies falling, you know, flying up, falling down, but also coming at the reader also creates a number of situations where you have these kind of 3D or quasi 3D effects. Um, Japanese artists, including Tatsumi, do know American 3D comics uh, roughly in this period, so they might have been looking at that a little bit. So some of the, not the ones that require the glasses, but other ones have these like pop out effects. Um, but you know, Tezuka also kind of does things like this. So around judo action, you have all these different types of uh, uh, artistic techniques being uh, tried out. 
Now, the page that uh, Tatsumi focuses on as the most important page prior to when he actually does Gekiga is this page from this judo manga. And he says it's this page which shows uh, an evil jujutsu master um, on a rickshaw uh, about to cut down his foe, right? Um, it breaks it down into these panels, uh, focuses each panel on kind of one moment, one action, right? And also creates, uses sound effects to kind of heighten the suspense of that, of that action, right? He says for him, this was the moment when he realized that you could use this kind of paneling to basically bring the reader into the suspense of uh, the comic page itself, right? So it happens inside the context of a judo manga at the same time that the, this judo manga, like all judo manga, also have highly uh, moralistic characters, right? What does he say here? Yes, judo is not something that belongs to just us. It belongs to all Japan. Judo is the way of humanity, of humans itself, right? It ends on this kind of moralizing uh, tale, uh, message. So this is the kind of stuff. Everybody did judo manga. Tsuge Yoshiharu, before he did mystery manga for the Kashihon market, and before he became in, big in Garo with his travel manga, also did a, one judo manga amongst many other things. Sometimes judo manga wasn't its own genre. It was usually folded into someone who wrote a lot of jidaigeki, a manga, which is basically manga about samurai and ninja and other historical swashbuckling type stuff, right? <clears throat> Even though most judo manga, they're either set now, now as in 1950s now, or in the early 20th century, late 19th century. So Tsugi Yoshiharu also draws one, this one about a one-armed uh, judo master, young master. And this is the kind of paneling he used. <clears throat> This is on the bottom, on the right image, this is the moment where he breaks his arm and then next panel you can see that he's lost his arm. You always have to have an evil person who's trying to destroy the, the, the good dojo, in this case not a karate master. And here you have kind of really kind of interesting pages, all sorts of techniques and done quite in a complicated way, kind of upside down, Images in water, right? Moons marking the seasons and the time, flips into the water, and these like spiral things that you see a lot going back to Fukuyaichi. Uh, effects only panels, upside down, a lot of feet. You see a lot of feet in judo manga too. <clears throat> this is a cool page on the right. And then, of course, this one also has to end on a moralizing note, even though the comic is basically driven by action the whole way through. <clears throat> like this. Now, <clears throat> in 1956, when the first Kashihon anthology, rental book anthology for mystery manga, comes out, The Shadow, which is seen as like the um, periodical in which the language of Gekiga was worked out and popularized, what do you see on the cover? But you see a kid flipping uh, a villain using judo techniques, right? So it's very clear, not only because of what the artists were doing prior to them all turning to mystery in 1956, but also you oftentimes find judo activity, judo acts inside um, the mystery manga uh, themselves. Uh, before hard-boiled action starts and guns solve everything in manga, you usually have a youth detective um, whose main arm armament is his judo techniques. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'll race through the rest very quickly. But outside of this world, outside of Gekiga, uh, judo is also having a big impact on Japanese youth culture, prose fiction, and eventually uh, manga. Uh, it kind of founds the genre of spokon, uh, sports grit, basically hardcore sports manga about self-sacrifice to the point and hard practice until the point where you break or maybe even kill yourself on the playing field, right? Mainly it's structured around baseball, but a lot of the people who ended up drawing baseball started off also by doing, drawing and writing martial arts manga and stories, one of them being Kajiwara Iki, 
who went on to become the, off, the writer for Star of the Giants, the big baseball manga of the 1960s, and also Ashita no Jo, the big boxing manga. Um, he himself had a black belt in judo and karate and a number of things. He was very close with Riki Dozan, a wrestler, um, and uh, some other famous karate master. Um, but he really liked Fukui Eiichi's Igaguri because he didn't like Tezuka. He thought it was frivolous. He thought it was nonsense. It was too fantastical. And he really liked Fukui Eiichi because it was reintroducing moral characters back into youth fiction that had been popular prior to World War II. And he wanted to kind of reestablish those strong masculine conservative figures inside youth fiction in the 1950s. He started doing so by writing prose, illustrated prose fiction that you see on the right. And then very quickly, he starts doing different types of mixed martial arts uh, uh, stories and manga. And then what you're seeing on the left is two later manga that he scripted uh, that were judo uh, manga. Right. This is also occurring, what happens in the 1960s, judo was, Japan claimed judo, but then in the 1960s, it start, starts losing its position as the world's judo uh, capital because in 1961, uh, Japan loses in the world championships to a Dutch wrestler named Anton Giesnick, and they lose again in 1964 at the Olympics. So there's this kind of shame that Japan had lost control of judo. And that anxiety has also played out a lot in Kajiwara Iki's stories in manga in the 1960s. Something you see also in baseball manga, I started this by saying that, you know, Fukui Eiichi, he started off by drawing, redrawing baseball manga or drawing baseball manga and then shifted to judo. And you see many early baseball manga or mixed martial arts manga. Even in the most famous baseball manga from the 1960s, you oftentimes have judo-related characters. Um, what's most famous, something that's famous about Star of the Giants is the maku, these demon pitches that fly and spiral and are thrown so hard that they break bodies and bats, right? But who can withstand, who, who can hit that and withstand it? Who's, who has the guts to even stand up to a plate against, the, the plate against pitches like that? It's oftentimes uh, players who have martial arts trainings and oftentimes who's gonna catch those pitchers? Well, oftentimes, I don't have good images, the high school teams usually recruit their catchers from the judo squad. Right? So there's this kind of feedback that happens constantly in baseball manga in the 60s and 70s that judo techniques, you know, techniques in terms of cartooning techniques, but also like judo's worked into the story in different ways. And one of the most famous and uh, acute, obvious ways this happened is a uh, baseball manga that was probably even a bigger hit than Star of the Giants was Dokaben. Uh, it was a big animated uh, series as well. Uh, by someone named Mizu, Mizu, Mizushima uh, Shinji, who died earlier this year. Um, it's known as a baseball uh, manga, but it started off actually as a judo manga. Um, so here we're seeing uh, in the beginning, the main uh, um, character is Yamada Taro, kind of a very plain name. Um, he does not know judo, but he's clearly modeled on Igaguri. He comes from the countryside, he joins a school, He's a transfer student, just in the same way that Igaguri starts. Um, he ends up joining the judo club, um, but as the story goes, over the first year, the baseball club has, doesn't have enough players, so the judo club starts feeling bad, so they start judo club, join, beca basically becomes the baseball team at this high school. So there's moments in the beginning where you know, the judo players are paying, playing baseball in their judo gi, in their outfits, right? <clears throat> Now, as these episodes go on, the judo players are also competing um, for, you know, at the national champion, champion, high school championship as judo athletes, and they go to the Kodokan. The Kodokan is the big training institution for judo in Tokyo that was founded by Kano Jigoro back in the early 20th century. That appears again here, and they go to fight there, and look on the left, who is the referee? The referee is Igaguri. So Mizushima brings back Fukui's old star, now, as you know, it is probably his 1930, in his, in his 30s or 40s, whatever he would have been at that time, and he oversees the training of these high school students, not as only as good fighters, but all, also as moral boys. Right. So there's this neat feedback thing. This kind of it completes the story, you know, in a very neat way. At this point, that the one of the most famous uh, baseball manga, probably the most famous baseball manga in Japan. 
Dokoben begins as a judo manga, and as it ceases being judo manga, it introduces Igaguri. I think, he, I think they also fight Igaguri's uh, karate uh, nemesis at some point. Um, and uh, I had a good open, I got, man, just, I had the best finishing line just now, but it's gone. But anyway, so th this happens at the end. It kind of brings close, uh, brings close to an era of, uh, of the intermixture of basically judo and baseball and martial arts in comics. So anyway, this is this kind of story I'm, I'm working out for the back of the book uh, that will be published by Bubbles, hopefully uh, this winter, but I'm not so confident that it will be, but it will come out soon. And I hope you all enjoy it. And I am, oh, there is a promo ex excerpt um, available for free at the Bubbles table at table B14 if you'd like to pick it up. Right, that's uh, one chapter and then the first couple paragraphs of my essay. And this is just to uh, promote uh, three books that I've uh, translated uh, that are on sale now. And I also learned while here a number of other books. Um, Retrofit Comics, I did a number of them. They unearthed some books that I thought were out of print. They have some copies of that. Uh, Yoko uh, Hirata Hiroshi's Bloody Stump Samurai, which has went out of print recently. They have some copies of that. And also some of the books I did with Breakdown Press that are out of print. There's a distributor that works with British publishers named Fanfare. Uh, they unearthed some copies of Hayashi Seichi's Red Red Rock and some other things. So if you're into that stuff and don't want to pay 80 bucks online, you might want to go up and try to snatch the last copies. So anyway, uh, that's it. And I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. Yep. If, you, if you have a question, please come over here to the microphone, and we'll get you so that everyone can hear you. So other than Batkid, what other translations have you done? Have you done any Tezuka translations or like forwards for them at all? What's that? Uh, other than Bat Kid, have you done any other, like, what other translations have you done? Like, have you done um, any Tezuka translations? Um, I feel like I've seen your name before somewhere, so. Go to mangaberg.com okay. to answer your question. Okay, cool. <laughs> there. Yeah, so, uh, Tezuka Social media tag at mangaberg, webpage mangaberg.com. Hi there. Um, so you were talking about how in Japan, Igoguri became like almost a rival to Tezuka. Mm -hmm. So my question is kind of what, Tezuka is much more popular in the West than Igoguri, which isn't really well known at all. Mm -hmm. So like what factors and what features about Tezuka's work do you think made it so accessible to the West, whereas like a lot of these other popular works weren't? Um, I don't know if it's, that's really the reason why, the, I mean the main reason why is Fukui died in that's 1954. Fair. That'll so do he, you know, Another title that he, he had just started drawing when he died, uh, it's called Akado Suzunosuke, it's a kendo manga. He died, he only wrote the first chapter and he died before it came out. It was picked up and then it became kind of a radio adaptation, a drama adaptation, then a live action TV adaptation. So it's one of the first manga that, you know, benefited from what they call the media mix of like cross merchandising on different platforms. But Fukui did not live to see that, right? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, what's really known in manga and animation history is uh, Atomo, when Astro Boy was made into an animation in, what's the year, 63, 62? I can't remember. But like that's usually seen as the boom where, you know, all these things like collect around, there's the manga, then there's the animation adaptation, the toys, et cetera, et cetera. Gotcha. So my guess is that, you know, he probably would not, Tessico is also vast, very prolific and worked in a lot of different genres, right? Fantasy, science fiction, shoujo, shonen, everything. So he had that breadth, and Fukui did not, right? That breadth of imagination. Um, also, the reason, part of the reason Fukui died was he didn't, couldn't draw fast enough, so he, I think he just overworked himself. You know, Tezuka is famously very quick. But, you know, probably Fukui, had he lived longer, would have found ways to kind of uh, made his practice more viable with a, a studio at some point. So I think part of the reason is just like he died before um, like manga became part of uh, a wider enter enter entertainment mm -hmm. industry, which you know facilitated later on its 
export into other countries, perhaps. Okay. I mean, I think there's also some more basic things. It's like, you will, I promise, you will enjoy Igaguri when it comes out. Um, but you'll see it's, you know, it's, it's very message oriented. Not that Tezuka's manga can't be, oftentimes. Um, but it's a little bit more focused on a point, right? And I think the point that it's trying to make probably meant more to Japanese men, mm -hmm. specifically at that moment in time and into the 60s and 70s. But Tezuka, obviously, you know, it's like his work is sometimes dated, but it has a, a wider breadth in terms of issues and appeal. So I think those might be the different. Right, right, got you. Why. Thank you so much. Yeah. Fukui did not live to see, to reap the benefits of the industry that he, his te techniques helped create, essentially. Hi, I'm kind of short. Hi. <laughs> um, I did come into class late, so I apologize if I'm yes. repeating yeah. myself, yeah. but um, I wanted to know how you initially got into the industry of translation and what your experience has been in translation. I also did translation as well. I lived in Japan for a long time. Okay. So I wanted to know your personal experience and how you got into the industry, specifically manga, and um, just your experience throughout. I'll give you a very brief version of this. But sure. um, I did a PhD in art history. Okay. I wrote my dissertation on uh, manga. Okay. A magazine called Garo, okay. alternative manga. Um, taught for a while, realized that I wasn't going to be able to make a living in academia alone. So I started going freelance translating. Okay. Uh, almost all the books that I've translated, um, uh, I have organized and been the agent for. Okay. Um, which I think is fairly rare within the industry. Yeah. Nothing's been assigned to me. I've made up my own work. Yeah. Um, um, so that's, that's basically how I, I, I got into it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It was always for me a, a mainly a historian. I see myself as mainly an art historian, comics gotcha. historian. Gotcha. And translation was basically just a way to create uh, platform for me to publish my scholarship in a place that wasn't academic. Gotcha. Understood. Thank you so much. All right. Hi. I'm the line. So uh, my question is sort of more broadly about sports manga, the popularity of sports manga in Japan and the similar lack of popularity for sports comics in the States. And uh, I'd always been wondering about this. And I'm wondering if the point that you just made, if you could say more about that, about the message oriented part of it. If, if the audience there is more prepared to see the messages in a sports manga as opposed to the action, and then therefore, like in the States, there's just not that same expectation. Um, I mean, I think sports manga in Japan, they've sold off a combination of these, you know, tough, gritty, somewhat obnoxious male characters, right? Yeah. Um, plus all the action that goes on along with it, which fills up thousands of pages. So I think, I mean, someone who knows more about American comics can say here, I think, you know, you just have to think also about format, right? I've seen people, American cartoonists over older generations say, it's impossible to draw a sports comic, especially impossible to draw a baseball comic. How do you ever put that? Obviously it's been done in Japan yeah. a million times, right? Um, part of the reason I think is just, page space, the, the way that the, you know, baseball manga got really big in the 1960s at the same time that manga magazines became weekly. So you could like stretch out a game over a number of issues, 20 pages, 20 pages of just pitching and hitting, and a lot of sound effects, mm -hmm. right? Which was also enabled by all these gekiga effects that judo manga and mystery manga helped, right? Dramatizing gameplay itself. Um, and American comics just didn't really have that space, right? So I think, that's part of the reason. The other thing is, you know, people don't talk about this often. You know, there's people talk about how manga tied up with animation and toys, and that really kind of lifted up magazines and lifted the industry into what we know it today, the publishing industry into what we know it today. But there's also a very close relationship uh, between professional baseball and manga going back to the 1950s. Uh, there's a lot of sponsored features by Japanese baseball teams. They do interviews inside magazines. So you know, professional sports and particularly baseball, you also see sumo and also sumo wrestlers and professional wrestlers 
um, also appear in manga magazines. But there's also that close relationship for the love of baseball on TV. And you know, TV also breaks at the same time manga goes weekly in the, in the late 50s. So that's also part of it. I think it's like the weekly manga magazine format was also able to dramatize that action of weekly, of semi-daily sports play that kids could watch on TV. OK, so, thanks. Something like that. And that is time. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for coming.